Good afternoon. Let us start this session. Its title is Open Banking Right or Obligation. Actually, it's a very interesting and complex subject, and I believe that you can take your seats. It's a complex uh, subject. We only have one hour, so we'll try to maximally concentrate on this subject. Actually, questions arise, at least in this audience, what open banking is going to bring us. Is that our right or is that an obligation for us? How much will it cost and what will it lead to from the standpoint of economy and monetization? We'll try to discuss these issues with our panelists. I'm going to introduce our great speakers, Dmitry Babarusa, well, not in that order, Dmitry Babarusa, co-owner and executive director of a fintech startup or Salt Edge, who has passed all the stages of open banking development from screen scrapping to PSD2 and British open banking experience implementation. Chris Michael, Technical Director, Open Banking Limited, participated in or participates in developing uh, British open banking and knows all the technical subtleties and all the undercurrents. So Open Banking Limited introduces open APIs in Great Britain, and I hope Chris will share all the settleties and given little John, chairman of financial data, the best known expert and evangelist in the world. I call him the father of open banking. He knows all the insights about open banking and I hope that he will share the world experience and tell us what's happening in the world and what other countries face and how they solve open banking problems. Vladimir Potaparov, Chief Executive Director, VTB Capital Investment, Senior President, Vice President of uh, VTB Bank, op offers products through open APIs and has two successful cases, which I hope he will share with us and will explain to us what a P open banking is. Ilya Velder, Senior Vice President for Strategic Innovation at Akbar's Bank, implemented the model of a bank as a service and actively develops collaboration with fintech companies. And uh, unfortunately, ex Nadia Cherkasova had to urgently rush to Moscow. We have Anton Ogorodnikov, who is the deputy director of, for digital products from Atkriti Bank, who will talk about their experience of open API and a new model for the bank direct, the development. Uh, it is my understanding that there's a meeting with the chairman. Uh, so Alexei Petrov, uh, the co-owner of API Bank, is going to join us later. He represents Russian fintech, and he was the, one of the first to implement uh, the open source solution for open API publication. Uh, we had an open API session last time, and given I remember said uh, we only had bankers. We have bankers. Where are the technicians? So. We don't only have representatives of banks, but we also have uh, representatives of fintechs, both from Russia and abroad. So I think the discussion is going to be interesting. So let's start the discussion. Open banking is a global trend on the one hand, and there's a lot of debate about it in the world, about how this technology is developing 
through open APIs. Quite recently, the Banking Committee of the U.S. Senate that discussed foreign experience in open banking recognized, yes, Alexei, welcome, Hello. that the American financial market was lagging behind in open banking development. They took the example of the U.K. We know that the second directive was issued in 2015, which supposed that starting with January 2018, the requirements come into force. A year has passed, and as now, we see that European banks face serious problems. Not all the banks are ready to introduce open APIs. Uh, there are no standards. And you probably heard there was an open letter from uh, Tink Fintech Company who declared publicly that the bank infrastructure is is not ready and as the regulator uh, to display flexibility in uh, implementation of open APIs. So my first question is to Gavin. Well, on the one hand, this is a common trend. Everyone talks about it. Uh, it's something that the market really needs, and open economy is our future. But we see that there are very few successful cases. So I would like to ask you to comment on this situation and why it is only the UK that managed uh, to make that step. What barriers are there? Thank you. Uh, so the situation in 2013 when PSD2 was drafted was that uh, uh, no mention of uh, API uh, and in fact uh, PSD2 set out to be technology neutral. This was a mistake. We didn't know it at the time, and uh, it wasn't until 2015 in the UK that uh, uh, FinTech community proposed working with the banks to develop some architecture around uh, using APIs to comply with PSD2. And, uh, the unique advantage that then happened in the UK market was that the competition authority stepped across the financial regulators and compelled the nine largest banks in the UK to fund and work together on developing an actual standard. Um, and I want to use a very uh, particular language to distinguish between specification and standard. Uh, elsewhere in Europe, um, groups of banks have worked together and they've developed specifications. Um, but we have discovered, um, again, uh, people might say it's obvious when you look back at it, but uh, we discovered that the compliance with the specification and the development of actual standards were not quite the same thing. Uh, and then uh, Chris and his team that developed the capability in the UK um, then designed a, a full uh, compliance with the financial grade API, uh, which is a security profile standard designed by the OpenID Foundation. So it's uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. Um, but the, the key thing was that they then introduced uh, uh, conformance test suite. Um, so for everybody in the room that may not be quite clear on what an API is, um, so an API has got two components. It has the security profile, which enables the connection to be made, and it has the data payload. The data could be anything. It could be a mortgage, a loan, a pension, an investment, or payment data. It doesn't matter. But the security profile has to be the same so that it works like an electrical plug and socket where the two parts connect. If they're not the same, then you have to uniquely wire every single uh, connection 
in its own way. In Europe, there are uh, 6,000 banks that the fintechs like Tink you mentioned have to connect to, or like SaltEdge are uh, working on connecting to. And uh, frankly, um, the qualities of the API from a, a security profile perspective have been varied. And then it takes about maybe, and uh, Dimitri will give you more information on this, but uh, I hear in the market it can take anywhere from two weeks to sometimes two months to make the connection. It's a huge amount of resource on both the bank and the fintech side to engineer together. They have to work on it together. Uh, there's simply not enough technology resources in the world to do the job that's been set. So um, the and that's before you get to the functionalities. So the functionalities might be described as things like the data fields that come in the data payload. It could be things like whether or not the consent flow and architecture enables app to app as opposed to just browser to browser. There's things like that. Uh, and you could also look at um, the qualities of the customer journey. So going back to uh, January uh, 2018, uh, one of the big banks in the UK, before the standardization agenda was formalized, built a consent flow which had uh, 16 pages of HTML. 16. Sorry, can I just say that again? It had 16 pages of HTML and a five-minute timer. It was impossible for the customer to get through giving consent to share the data because the, the user experience was very, very poor. Um, and therefore, in the UK, because we had a governance model that enabled us to keep changing, um, whereas in Europe they were relying on a written law, uh, and you could comply with the written word but still not make it usable. So one of the advantages that Chris and his team had were that when they saw something wasn't right, they could keep working on fixing it and promote improvements on the standards. And I, I strongly recommend uh, for Russia, when you work on this, not, not to go into uh, micro detail in the written law and rules and have uh, a governance framework that enables uh, fintechs, uh, like uh, my dear colleague here, to input on what qualities they would like to see in the delivery. And uh, for the banking sector and the regulators and the fintechs and representatives of the consumer and the small business that will be ultimately the beneficiaries to, to engage in, in developing an output that really works and puts customers at the heart of the decisions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, it's important uh, to have a proactive position of the regulator, but also uh, the leadership, so to say, the leadership support of the market. Uh, nine banks, did you say, supported this initiative uh, and became the investors uh, of uh, the company that uh, launches the systems and introduces the systems. The second point you made is standardization, which became a key factor because uh, the UK has launched uh, uh, since uh, the 1st of January in, uh, 2018 the whole system. So it's important that you focused on standardization of information security and uh, in, uh, secu uh, security profile. And uh, the third part that is important, the third part point that is important is that uh, we have to look at open banking not simply as uh, uh, at uh, a technology of sorts, but uh, as a compilation of client uh, experience and whether the client uh, uh, gives his consent uh, to working within the open uh, banking. So this has become a key success factor for the UK, if I understand that correctly. So nine banks are working within that uh, area. And uh, another question is, what is happening globally? We know that in July, uh, Australia uh, um, as was said in the press, uh, uh, has four leading uh, banks uh, opened uh, their own APIs. 
they have a different, slightly different approach in Australia. They uh, not only entered the banking sector, but are working on a broader scale, but they had opened API. So within the open banking, uh, is it possible to be successful when the regulator says so, that it is important and, and it's needed, or are there examples where there are markets that actually understand that this is an important trend for its future development and form working groups, committees, commissions, and start developing? Uh, or uh, there, doesn't and there doesn't necessarily have to be a, a push from the regulator. So what's happening all over the world in other countries as far as initiating the process is concerned? Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, so um, FDATA, the organization I chair, uh, operates as a lobbying group in uh, Canada and the US and Mexico and Brazil and Colombia and uh, Japan, India, Australia and uh, throughout Europe. Um, the uh, the markets have evolved in different ways, and I, I think people have to remember that the uh, one of the key words that we use in the market is the word open. And some of the markets have delivered the API technology, but not the open. Uh, the difference is uh, the fundamental uh, human right to, as the data subject, to be able to uh, be economically empowered with your own data. Um, in Japan, for example, they have developed a, a reasonably high quality API. It's not been fully standardized yet, but they recognize the importance of doing that next. But they haven't established a customer data right. And therefore, when the first um, FinTech tried to connect to the first bank, the bank turned round and said on day one, that will be the equivalent of uh, five million US dollars before any business was done. And uh, it's similar in New Zealand uh, for now, but they're working on a change in law. And it's similar in the United States where there's, uh, through the financial data exchange, a lot of work between the banks and fintechs on designing the API and the security architecture, but still no right of the uh, customer to be able to share their data. So in the US, it's based on bilateral contracts between the bank and the fintech, which helps to facilitate uh, due diligence on uh, security, on uh, technology. But ultimately, the bank contracts with just the large fintechs because it's only worth their time to focus on large fintechs. And uh, the commercial model is how much money is the fintech going to pay for the connection? So I really don't feel that this is the correct approach. Um, the, the firms that should be allowed into this market should have a level playing field. They should all be allowed to make the connection because it is the customer who is compelling the data to share and not dependent on whether Bank A does a deal with FinTech A and Bank B does a deal with FinTech B. The customer, if they bank with Bank A and Bank B, should be able to choose which fintech they wish to use to support them. I think this is a fundamental part of it. And, uh, and then the firms that are in the market can apply to their national regulator. So in uh, India, they've set up a, a whole market customer data right. Um, in Australia, the same. I think um, Canada, Brazil, uh, all the markets that have looked at Europe and PSD2 are recognizing the importance of saying early on that limiting the scope to just payments is not the right way forward. Um, if the customer has a data right, they may wish to share their loan or investment or insurance information just as much. So, um, and it's important that the technology architecture, the electrical plug-in socket are designed in a way that you can enable that connection to take place in an easy way and for the open banking to trend to open finance. I believe in that very strongly. Um, so in Canada and Brazil, they're uh, tracking uh, UK open banking, they're tracking European uh, legislation. 
and recognising that it had its weaknesses and working out how to go beyond. In Japan and New Zealand, they're trying to work out how to develop a customer data right, the same in a lot of countries in Southeast Asia. Um, in Australia, they have the full data right, they're trying to work out how to deliver the technology. So every market is on a journey, and I, uh, I hope that they converge around principles of common standards, common approaches, and that uh, citizens around the world are able to uh, have the economic advantages and the economic empowerment of being able to share their data. The words, uh, the key word is the consent of the client and uh, the bank has its uh, obligations uh, towards the client. I would uh, also like to ask Chris a couple of questions uh, um, of a practical character. Chris, uh, could you tell us uh, about the uh, British experience uh, um, of uh, trans uh, uh, the um, interaction with the banks and which costs did banks incur for the investment and the introduction of open banking? Uh, maybe you could give us a, um, a comparison of value add uh, that had been created due to open banking and what does the market say about that? What do banks say about that? And has the time frame uh, contracted uh, for the uh, um, introduction of open banking? How much time does it take to get the new service? As far as I understand, the, the time has been uh, quite con uh, seriously cut. Um, I think the, there is no um, secret that it has been very challenging for banks, particularly the larger banks in the UK, to implement open banking. I think we are seeing that because there were lots of delays. The, what the banks were originally mandated, the CMA9, the la nine largest banks, what they were originally mandated to provide, and in the timescales, none of them made the first cut, the first round. They were all late. Um, and we're seeing that pattern now replaying across Europe with European banks. Um, so it's taken banks a lot longer to implement. It's cost them a lot more money. It's been a lot more difficult. Um, now, I think that's for several reasons. Firstly, most banks are not predominantly technology companies. They rely on other technology providers. And those technology providers were trying to build to and understand the standards. Um, that, I think, is getting much easier now, and that's why it's an important lesson for any other market to not create their own standard but follow the standard that exists and contribute to that and make it a, a truly global open standard because the technology companies that are out there in the market that, that, that build these API technologies, these security uh, platforms, identity and access management platforms, they are all pretty much globally now implementing the standard that we've developed in the UK and with the Open ID Foundation. So um, what was very difficult and very expensive for the, the UK banks, they were, if you like, guinea pigs in this, um, because they were trying to catch up and the, the technology providers were trying to catch up. What has also been challenging is the regulations in some areas were not very well written and they were open to interpretation. So over the, and it is still happening now, but over the last year, the regulations are still being adjusted and clarified, and that has a knock-on effect to the standards, so the banks are struggling with that, and the fintechs are also struggling with that. Um, I think what, um, what, what, what we're seeing now is that banks have invested a lot of money in this, as have fintechs, um, and there is a desire on both sides to build commercial models. Probably even a year ago, the banks and fintechs very much saw themselves as co competition. So, the, you know, certainly two years ago, almost none of the banks wanted to do this. They didn't want to do open banking. They saw it as a threat. It was going to cost them money. They were going into competition with fintechs who didn't have maybe the same obligations um, in some cases. But that has started to change now because what is happening with good quality APIs and a good quality customer experience, when that is done, and that has to be done properly, banks can then partner with fintechs to offer new services. We're starting to see that now with 
lending services, um, KYC onboarding services, where the data that banks have got on customers can be used in other um, areas that offer value to the customers. So you're seeing banks now who can offer loans to customers who do not bank with them, uh, both personal and business customers, and they can do that by the bank partners with a fintech to connect to another bank with the customer's consent and get that data and validate income, validate expenditure, offer a loan. It can be done in real time much more accurately and it, it results in good value for the customers, the banks benefit, the fintech benefits, everyone wins. And we're just seeing that those are kind of the first use cases, but there is a lot of intent now and recognition that actually open banking is a good thing. It's not just an expense on the banks and a frustration between banks and fintechs. It's starting to actually work. But I just want to make a point that there are two parts to open banking, really. One is data, where all the focus has been on to date, but the other important part of open banking is payments. And it's part of the regulations in the UK and Europe, but not part of the regulations in many other markets that are looking at this yet, is to require payment APIs. And I think that's where we're going to see a lot more, maybe, contention, but also more potential between what is a, a regulatory requirement and what is a um, commercial benefit for uh, participants in the market. Um, and it, that is something that uh, everyone, I think, is getting quite interested and excited about. It creates a lot of threats to some existing payment models. Um, and there's a lot of subtleties in there that we don't have time to go into today. But I think the, the, the kind of summary of this is that it's cost everyone a lot more money. It's been a lot harder. But there are benefits there. And um, as Gavin alluded to, if um, other markets look to copy and build on top of what we have done and hopefully contribute back so that it's a single global standard, then it makes it much easier for everyone to benefit. It makes it easier for banks to benefit, fintechs to benefit, and customers to benefit. Uh, thank you. Well, Chris didn't tell us how much it will cost. But nevertheless, uh, it is my understanding that the implementation of open banking uh, creates an ecosystem. So new uh, technological players appear, such as API hubs, which optimize uh, the uh, cost for the bank and develop uh, interaction between fintech and banks. Chris, you said that the quality of API is very important. <clears throat> There was, an, there was information that the availability or accessibility of open API in the first quarter of 2019 was only 83 percent. That's from the media. We'll ask the colleagues who work in the market about what the real situation is. So what happens with the accessibility of API, with its quality? It's not enough to approve a standard, but you need to provide a, a workable system. So what's happening with uh, the infrastructure and the quality of open API? Again, that's been no secret. We. In the UK, we publish on our website statistics about availability and performance of APIs from initially from the CMA9. We are trying to get that data from all of the banks. It's actually now close to 100 banks in the UK who are using the standard, in, uh, but it's only the CMA9 who are mandated. Um, the, um, the, 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 the quality, let's, let's talk about the quality and availability. We'll talk about them both in the, in, in, in the same uh, concept. So it is getting a lot better. It's still not um, maybe what you would need. You don't have 100% availability. Um, there are still issues with quality. I think there are two reasons for that. One is the same reason I spoke about earlier. It's been harder and the, the, the regulations have been changing, the standards have been changing, the banks have been struggling to keep up and you know that's, that's one reason or excuse if you like. Um, but I think fundamentally the regulations don't require 100% availability. They only require the same level of availability and performance as an existing banking online platform, like a, a website or a mobile app. And I don't know about the Russian market, but in the UK, most of the big banks have got core systems which get taken down from time to time. There is, you know, what we're seeing now with the CMA9 certainly is equivalence largely in terms of performance and availability with existing platforms. So it's 
it's acceptable in most cases for the account information transaction, the read API, the data side, um, because if you can access via screen scraping, you should be able to access via an API. It's the same sort of equivalence. It's not 100% and it's not good enough for many payment scenarios, and that's the kind of that's a big concern. Um, but I think it ultimately comes down to incentives. You know, I, I use the phrase that no one does something very well if they're told to do it. People do things well because they want to do it. So if you've got that balance right, and you need to have a bit of both, you need to have a regulatory driver that requires banks, but it could also require players in other, other, sec other sectors, not just banking. If there's a regulatory requirement for APIs, um, but that they will be implemented much better and this is what we're starting to see, this correlation between the performance and availability is getting better, but also the banks are realising that they can partner with fintechs to build commercial services off the, off the top, then things do get better all around. I mean, it, the, the challenge at the moment we have in the UK is more about payments. Account information is, I wouldn't say is necessarily perfect by any means, but it's satisfactory and it's solving a lot of use cases. In Europe, they are still some way behind. Um, and payments, though, is the real concern. How we get to a situation where there's really high performance, high availability for, for payment scenarios. And I would maintain that the banks have got to have some commercial reason for wanting to do it in order to do it really well. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, well, I, it is my understanding that the UK has made a lot of uh, efforts and a lot still has to be done that still banks and fintech con companies found a win-win decision. Well, uh, as Chris said, nine banks were mandated to open APIs and actually over 100 banks opened APIs. So the open API does create a win-win solution for the market participants. Now I would like to come down to practical matters and ask Dmitry. Dmitry, your company is an API hub. Actually, it's a technological partner that allows banks to use open API as fast as possible while interacting with fintechs. And secondly, you had some experience in getting a British license. Because another important component is that fintech and the API consumer must be accredited, must get a license. So my first question is, what your business? What is your business? Uh, do banks see you as a competitor? Are they apprehensive of interacting with you? And tell us about your experience of getting a license. How long did it take? How painful it was? Well, let's start with the first question. Do the banks stopped being scared of us as soon as API appeared about, uh, after the emergence of standards uh, and regulations that uh, allow us to use API? From the standpoint of access and licensing, that process took about a year. Uh, starting from the point when we set up the company, we worked with lawyers, we prepared the uh, business model, we profiled the security because the regulator checks on all that. Well, uh, so eight months passed since the application was submitted. Uh, there were some more questions about insurance, about uh, some business issues on bi of business models, but and we got the license in March this year. So after that, we started integrating with banks. Yes, the situation in the UK is much better than in Europe. 18 months is a long time which allowed the British banks quite efficiently to provide good API based on stable and well thought of standard. Uh, in the rest of Europe, the situation is much worse. If you're talking about the availability of API in Germany, Spain, France, Italy, I would say 10 to 15%. Although by law, the full availability should have taken place long ago. Unfortunately, well, 
the banks had to submit sandboxes uh, for connection with fintechs was uh, six months ago, and a lot of uh, fintechs with which we integrated uh, had no real API production behind them. One of the problems that we faced as a technical service provider and as a bank partners was the identification. We had to use uh, certificates which was were to be issued by qualification center, but they didn't issue them, so we couldn't get those certificates uh, in order to use production API. And we still see some banks that cannot check whether their certificate is valid. There are some problems with that. From the standpoint of uh, working with banks, we work in two modes. We can provide compliance API with third-party certification, and we provide a gateway for access to financial, uh, well, I mean, account information and payment initiation. Uh, talking about the API hub, the most difficult thing is to explain what is to be done. Because a standard is important for the bank. It's the language that we talk. But we, the bank must be responsible, must answer some questions if FinTech has some questions. Uh, well, if something is wrong with the user journey, especially when we're talking about authorization and consent issuing, uh, if some data is unavailable, what we faced on was the limitations on payment account only. When previously uh, the fintech users saw all the information about his accounts, both uh, credits and deposits and investments, uh, now it's only the current account, and depending on the country and the bank standard, it's either a debit or a credit card. And the first question the user asks is, why am I getting smaller service, although the law provides uh, for a bigger one? And uh, working with banks is very important here so that the bank understand what is to be done, to understand that this is a channel of, commu of communication with their users, which uses a different tool. Yes, the bank does not control the fintech interface, but it's a bank customer. Uh, how long does it take to integrate? So the bank comes to you and fintech right, says, I want this fintech. And how long does it take uh, from the first handshake, so to say, to providing the service to the client thanks to your platform? That doesn't work like that. Usually uh, the user says, I want a uh, connection with this and this and this bank. On the one hand, it's very convenient because as different from Japan, for instance, where you need a contract between FICTEC and each bank or each bank and each FinTech, it's enough to have a European license uh, and you can register. But the processor differs from country to country and from consortium to consortium and standard and standard. In the UK, you can also uh, actually takes a couple of hours uh, because uh, it's done, well, it's real hours because there's a single standard. Maybe not all of the banks in the UK support the same standard, but uh, the most widespread is Open Banking UK standard, but there are realizations by Berlin Group and other providers. If we're talking about continental Europe, it depends. Most banks don't have automatic connection to API. You need to undergo registration on at a portal. Sometimes they ask you for additional documents uh, and certificates. For instance, we were asked to provide a uh, letter of attorney by the director, uh, signed by the notary public that uh, we uh, want to connect to this uh, bank. We explained to them that the law does not demand that, so it's an obstacle and it impedes it. The bank read the law and agreed. So there's a lot of uh, issues with process, not with the standard. 
And secondly, from the stand technical spe specification standpoint, there's uh, lots of standards. There's uh, Polish IT, Slovak IT. Uh, so the zoo is big, so to say, and with different animals and different size. And sometimes integration takes a couple of months or three months, and the most difficult thing is to get a response from the bank. So you can wait for an answer for a week, because for them it's not a priority. It's, uh, yes, we have connected about 500 APIs, but this process goes on very slowly. You need dynamic, titanic resources, you need a lot of communication. Sometimes it's a problem with keys. Uh, some uh, banks uh, actually refused from what we did because it was not needed for them. So uh, you see that apart from the standards, the governance is very important because a year to get a license is too much in my opinion. Well, we are talking about flexibility. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have very little time because the session uh, discusses so a lot of uh, important issues. But I suggest that we return to Russian experience. During the last uh, uh, the year that has passed since the last Finopolis, a concept for the implementation of open APIs in Russia was developed. There are booklets at the entrance to the room, and you can find this information on our website. Uh, the concept has been passed on to the central bank. The main three ideas in this concept is the need of getting a direct consent from the client. It's a standardization in, of open API as part of information security and security of data and the necessary of accreditation of uh, fintech of an uh, API customer from the standpoint of KYC and from the standpoint of a technical readiness. Currently, on the uh, on the platform of the association, we have worked out standards uh, um, access to on access to account and payment APIs, and we're going to discuss them. Um, and they will be discussed as industrial standards. In the meantime, we are planning uh, to pilot this uh, technology. Actually, a lot of banks have already started doing this, and I hope that some of the speakers will share their experience. I would like to ask Ilya Akbar's bank has already uh, um, launched a number of pilots, pilot projects. One of the last the latest cases uh, uh, was uh, signing a, an agreement with uh, an API bank. Uh, so how are you organizing your work with uh, FinTech and uh, um, how are you uh, planning uh, to uh, use uh, the uh, standards, and will that allow for the development of a new model uh, of a bank, bank as a service? So what is, is it a part of the strategy of your bank? Uh, thank you very much. Colleagues, um, I can see that uh, there is uh, a lot of interest to this topic. Therefore, we have a lot of people in the auditorium. Uh, and. Um, the recent research is saying that 70% of financial institutions consider uh, the introduction of uh, open API standards uh, is a significant element for uh, the uh, digital transformation of financial um, institutions. And uh, we understand all that. And uh, today, the sharing economy uh, um, proceeds, not, uh, uh, proceeds uh, not only within the 
the bank, but outside the bank. And uh, we cannot ignore this. In uh, the majority of cases, we represent the uh, financial back uh, uh, that uh, provides for the uh, satisfaction of the client's uh, needs. Uh, uh, the part of our one part of our strategy is uh, the development of our infrastructure, the product line, the uh, internal uh, competencies. Uh, to allow us uh, to provide improved services to our clients. Thank you very much uh, to our uh, 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 Cohen Keeper and IP Bank, um, one of our partners. So you can take a look at this slide and you can see the advantages of uh, our services. We are issuing uh, a prepaid virtual card, uh, and uh, this allows uh, the client uh, to use it uh, to his uh, or her benefit. Uh, we uh, are cutting costs on acquiring and quite a number of other benefits. Um, also, I'd like to say that as far as costs are concerned and time to market, uh, it's a topic that we do not uh, 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 like to disclose uh, at great length. But uh, the preparation uh, is divided into two parts. That is the preparation of the infrastructure of the bank. It took us two to three months. And the interaction with startups. Uh, I think you're going to smile at that. I suppose our colleagues are going to smile at that, because we did talk about that uh, last year. Uh, but it took uh, us previously months to do that. Now it's taking us weeks. And that's a great improvement. This is, well, it'll take us a couple of hours in the near future. This will be our next KPI, I suppose. Uh, so currently, uh, it's just weeks, and I hope that uh, in the near future we will uh, be able to provide this service for our clients. As far as the costs are concerned, um, I uh, can say that they're not very high, not uh, 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 awfully high, uh, and uh, it takes approximately uh, uh, two months of dedicated work uh, uh, in order for that to happen. Um, so Ilya uh, Akbar's uh, saw a lot of advantages in working with FinTech and doesn't see any threat from FinTech. As far as open banking in Russia is concerned, uh, considering uh, the fact that we are describing trends, so is that a right or an obligation? I think it's one of the conditions of survival. Uh, when we do understand that it is one of the prerequisites for uh, uh, survival, when we see that banks, uh, banks and platforms providing API are growing, any dialogue between a financial institution and uh, uh, any startup starts with, hello, we have API, we're ready. Now let's discuss the technical details. Uh, that's been going on for quite a long time. So it's both a right and an obligation and an understanding that it's a, uh, it's a, a prerequisite for survival. In, otherwise, uh, in other words, this is a right and obligation to survive. That's quite correct. Um, I would like to give the floor to the representative representative of another bank, Anton Agarodnikov. Um, so in uh, getting ready to work with uh, FinTech, I suppose you have gained a lot of positive experience. Uh, and uh, it takes to be successful to provide a, a, a well-prepared uh, infrastructure. How did you organize this uh, process? How long did it take you? this internal restructuring of the system? How long does it did it take you? Uh, because it's a question of being ready for it, the readiness of the bank as far as the infrastructure is concerned. And apart from the technology, whether you had the mental ability and capability to do it and mental readiness to do that. Thank you very much for this question. I would like to just say that open API is not a technology, not just simply an infrastructure not a channel uh, for communication. It is uh, a new way of thinking. 
Uh, this is an important uh, a factor that needs to be taken into account because apart from technology and infrastructure, uh, open API will work if the uh, mental processes and the thinking processes are ready for that, and there's uh, a level of accept acceptance of it. Uh, I can only say that uh, the infrastructure that and the readiness to integrate with the part with partners and um, has become apparent because we've moved on to the uh, digital processes starting from scratch, uh, but are moving into omni-channel, multi-channel uh, business integration with partners, enriching data, feeding data. All this can be resolved only with the inner internal readiness and internal infrastructure. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, uh, it's a process that takes time and can uh, transpire only if there is a certain level of thinking, a certain level of understanding. And also, you need to bear in mind the costs, uh, uh, the costs, uh, the technological readiness. All this is a way of solving a problem, uh, And uh, but you need to set a business target. So I'd like to say that for us as a bank, uh, the introduction of standards in open API and specifications uh, uh, is important, but uh, it will not uh, take a lot of money to do that uh, because the level of readiness is already there. We're ready to provide the necessary services, and we've already got a platform for it, a foundation for it. And we're working with a lot of partners on the market, I mean non-banking uh, partners. Uh, we are developing uh, products, innovative product products in different spheres, not only banking spheres. For instance, you know that we are creating a B2B uh, trading platform. And as a bank, uh, we uh, provide a database uh, on working with nomenclature. Uh, we as a bank provide uh, the so-called window shop uh, of uh, the uh, products and services. And we provide a payment uh, authorization uh, system. Any client can use this uh, platform, the payment services and lending services. So this third part, this third drive, so to say, uh, that provides non-banking, non-financial sector uh, is uh, uh, can be used for uh, uh, different types of clients, clients, different players on uh, the market. And um, this thinking uh, is created uh, um, uh, on a new basis uh, and can uh, be created in any company working with any partner. In other words, an open API is not a technology. It's a way of thinking. Uh, and when you think that way, follow this logic. And when you think that your partner uh, is uh, fintech, and this is the way a bank should think, uh, they will be successful in uh, such projects. And it's going to be a win-win situation for both participants. Yes, yeah, so you're quite right when you talk about the strategic view of uh, this uh, aspect uh, on the development of business as a whole. Uh, and you were lucky to start building this structure from scratch, as you have uh, pointed out. So your service infrastructure was created at the level of the foundation. But uh, there are quite a lot of banks which already have their foundation uh, in place. So it's not going to be a very easy way. It's going to be a way of restructuring this foundation. In other words, restructuring structuring, rebuilding its architecture and start working with the microservice ar architectures. You have said uh, that apart from being technologically ready, uh, there is a question of where do you get your uh, 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 money from, the profit from. I understand that you add on other services, and it's important for clients. Clients whim in the
this situation. But let's uh, uh, imagine that uh, a bank has uh, certain systems, needs certain investments in order to restructure its uh, infrastructure and start working with open API. But at the same case, can this bank start earning on these non-banking services? Which measures should the market provide uh, for the banks to be interested in moving in that direction? So what do you think about that? Maybe, Alia, we will be able to ask you about the so-called premium uh, API, the um, um, non-for-profit uh, API, so uh, uh, providing data uh, free of charge. What do you think? Uh, can this be somehow provided? Where do you find the means to do that? That is a very good question. Uh, quite often, banks and large organizations uh, uh, have to make difficult decisions because uh, launching a system uh, needs a lot of expenditures on the part of the bank. and. Uh, more often, uh, the following scenario works. Uh, the scenario based on concrete cases, uh, uh, on concrete examples, on testing uh, hypotheses and testing the grounds, learning uh, from uh, advantages and benefits um, and uh, drawbacks. So uh, we are talking about different phases. Um, uh, different phases of uh, the whole process, uh, looking at payments, transactions. In other words, uh, this uh, uh, experience can create new values on uh, the market and uh, uh, provide for the development on fintech on the market. Every service uh, can uh, work with a particular bank and integrate with uh, a particular bank, and uh, there are quite a lot of resor resources. We have a, uh, uh, the so-called happy past and two-week sprints. Uh, happy past takes two weeks, uh, uh, one week for working it out one week for launching the system. Um, all uh, this uh, precludes, uh, all this uh, is the starting point for uh, further uh, agreements. There are services on the market. If they can be multiplied, if they can be replicated, uh, and banks will uh, take them uh, on a board, this will uh, lead uh, to a successful experience. There are lots of examples like that on the market, and this speeds up uh, the testing of the hypothesis, so to say. Uh, some of the APIs don't have to be introduced uh, in, in internally uh, initially, but you can test them uh, and you can test the results uh, of their work in uh, other partners. So if we go back to the question of the so-called premium API, um, I would uh, uh, actually uh, postpone the uh, discussion of this question. Because uh, well, the startups are going to pay for this, and probably should start with uh, uh, some base, like with biometry. Uh, and uh, when we see some value in it, we can add new services and uh, maybe make them pay, uh, make them paid. So to develop the internal infrastructure case by case, understanding the value that the bank is getting. You wanted to ask, and uh, the uh, uh, the journey into this space uh, had often the banks thinking about compliance, uh, that there is a rule they have to make things work. What what's actually happened, um, looking back through time, is the the banks have all uh, learned now to consume the API coming out of their competitors. So. Um, it has moved from being delivered by the bank in compliance to moving to their innovation department. And they're starting to learn about where their customers are when they're not with them. So one bank has a customer, and that customer has financial relationships with other players in the market. So they want to know where those other customers are, what products they're buying and at what price point, what interest rate they're being charged or, or getting. Um, they want to use it for uh, providing better money management tools to their customers, for fast onboarding, for credit decisioning, 
for affordability through the life cycle of the loan and not just before the loan is given, uh, for helping the customer sweep money into an investment account. So um, there's a huge opportunity for the banking sector uh, to deliver this, not just for the fintechs, but for themselves. If you want to distribute a regulated financial product through a digital channel in all regulated markets across the world, you have to know enough about the customer to sell the product to them compliantly and to treat them fairly. So if you're a financial institution with ambitions to distribute online or through an app, know your customer. Well, so there's additional carrot that uh, uh, Gavin talked about. Alex said, API Bank is actually something similar to API Hub in Russia. So could you tell, speak about your experience in our open banking ecosystem that is yet being created. So can you get, make a virtual bank in 30 minutes? How is your business developing and where do you see the opportunities? Thank you. Good afternoon. Yes, we are similar to API Hub conceptually. Well, we don't have uh, so many uh, banks at our back. Yes, you can spend 30 minutes technically, but it's impossible so far to overcome the legal issues in half an hour. And really, about 90% of all the efforts are spent on approval of uh, contracts uh, the, uh, uh, between fintech that comes to us and the bank. That's the greatest volume of work. I heard that in the UK you don't need direct contracts between fintech and bank, and that solves the problem. And probably this is uh, the key thing that I expect from the regulator. But that doesn't happen because the banks are so bad, that because they are afraid that the regulator would come and ask them what they were, what, what they are doing. Currently, you need to find a solution that already exists in the security of compliance to see uh, the standards which were developed for uh, remote banking service or uh, regulations about the banking agents. So you need to cross, to make a cross between uh, two different things and uh, we have integrated technically in two weeks but uh, the legal issues and finding a business model took a year well it was most about the business model not the legal issues and I'm trying to render it to the bankers that I talked about that you don't have to calculate the cost of the case with me or when I come and tell them we are integrated they tell me give me give us the case and I say there's a hundred of them and it's impossible to cal to uh, develop a model well let's start with the start with the biggest one so the bank sees it and says well let us try and actually you have to overcome this barrier each time and so oh, this is about the mentality. You need to change the mentality. And quite often, we're not even trying to charge money for connection from the bank. Ilya, we didn't charge you. Do you want the truth? Yes, our fintechs need a selection of banks. Why they are afraid to work directly? Because uh, spending time on the legal integration, on the technical integration to adapt to the existing APIs and, uh, is a one-way road. Uh, that's why they come to us and the regulator need to help us. Yes. Well, I linked that with the problem of uh, six months of uh, uh, the negotiating 
the contract. The problem is that there is no clear definition of responsibility and risks between fintechs and banks. And really, the regulation that we see in the UK helps resolve this problem, not only technically to define the standards, but to define the rules of the game, to define the relationships and distribution of risks and responsibilities. And that helps a lot. But I want to ask you another question. When I talk to some banks, they tell me, OK, we're technically ready. We already have a microservice architecture. OK, let's try. But where are the fintechs? The fintechs are not there. There's no market. And although London well, was recognized in September, well, uh, it was recognized uh, the capital of fintech. Uh, it's no longer New York. And maybe Gavin will uh, say that this is thanks to the open banking that created possibilities for the development of fintech and actually stimulated some investment. Because during this year, the volume of investment in the UK increased fourfold. Uh, whereas in the rest of the world, it was twofold increase. So open banking really creates conditions for investment in fintech. Yet, is there fintech in Russia? Is there something to connect to? My favorite question. Are we usually look at fintech as a service for the end user, but our fintech is different. Our banks are very high tech and cool. And when there's a uh, European banks send uh, a uh, release for an iPhone, make a release that's. Uh, something new for Europe, but we are way ahead. We don't solve small problems of our clients. We have cool banks. Any regional bank is cooler than big European banks. I'm not mentioning the UK, but I know European, continental European banks very well. Our banks are more narrowly specialized. We have excellent fintechs in B2B, like electronic guarantees and aggregators and electronic platforms that issue e-guarantees and uh, people with financial analysis from uh, BFMs. And there are fintechs that we haven't heard about because they don't have a public history. They don't have the customer in agriculture or at uh, the Russian railways, the Uber of uh, uh, carriage trains, or you know, the people queue up uh, for well, at filling stations for weeks, uh, and uh, fintech helps that. And those are deep infrastructural fintechs, and fintechs help them. But when we present something, we present a story for the end user, something that we take out of the, uh, something to impress the end user, a letter shop uh, that provides cashback and loyalty. But it's not about the banks. It's uh, deeper than the bank. It works with the manufacturer's networks, with the receipts and things like that. And bank is it only an interface for money delivery. So the bank is needed as a mail office. But all the fintech is inside. So we do have fintech, only it's different. So we need to create awareness for fintech. Thank you very much. Uh, let's come back to the banks. There's a big bank, and there is. We were all 
talking about access to account, and VTB provided an open API for an investment product. Vladimir, tell us, please, how APIs help develop investments. Thank you very much for the question. It was It's difficult to be the last speaker, but I will try to tell you something of interest. Well, we're all talking about API, and I like the word survival. Survival is important. Everyone is building different platforms, and unless you build a platform, you don't exist. But if I say, uh, but I say that unless we, you have a quality service, and unless you provide a seamless uh, service with availability uh, uh, product over all the channels uh, that are convenient for the clients, then such models will not develop. And when two years ago, I could uh, do some brokerage in addition to what to my regular occupation. I looked at a very complex product which potentially has a lot of future in this country because deposits will hardly grow. And uh, we saw we looked at API um, possibility because uh, there's nothing new about API uh, and AI is probably uh, API is probably older than artificial intelligence. So uh, we tried to take a traditional banking product. It's not a story about building a platform and connecting everyone to fintech and then the bank will be responsible for everything. But let's look at a different story. If there, if a bank has a product that it can submit to other channels, and the bank is a big fintech, and we compete with the guys who have their platforms and who provide access to the client's audience. Well, we looked at the business media, that's RBK channel, whose audience is over 700,000 unique users a month. We implemented API mechanisms from us to them. And now you can come to an RBK website and without leaving the media resource while listening uh, to the radio, you can open a brokerage account at VTB and buy over 5,000 different instruments. It only takes a month or to six weeks, nothing difficult about it. Well, certainly that seamless experience uh, or establishing that seamless connection uh, is a, a different story. It takes about seven months. Uh, the payback period is seven months. And if you want the bank sector to develop, banks should have high quality products. Without a problem product, you can have uh, a platform, but look at uh, what the platform competition costs and compare that to Google and Apple. So I think you could focus on the product, and if you have a product, then you can sell it through uh, I just can sell it through uh, different uh, distance channels, uh, digital te channels. The second co uh, case we realized together with the post bank, uh, Pochta Banka, that is uh, selling uh, bonds uh, to the uh, public. Uh, the product uh, uh, took long longer to uh, launch, uh, but uh, you can uh, get online uh, on uh, to Pochta Bank and you can uh, make uh, an investment. Uh, to into bonds, um, and it's going to be a distant distance banking uh, uh, operation. So uh, it is important uh, to uh, bear in mind that uh, responsibility is, op is uh, highly important for banks. Uh, um, the, uh, this uh, technology, API, uh, is uh, number two after social network, and I am sure that it will become number one uh, in a very short period of time in Russia. But there are certain restrictions, uh, such as regulation, and the second one 
on uh, is uh, security of uh, uh, personal data, uh, providing security for personal data. Uh, and this uh, information is very sensitive, so this has to be taken into account, of course. Uh, all the, uh, so therefore, I support both survival, uh, internal microservices, uh, everything you've pointed out. But if you try uh, to uh, settle uh, everything on uh, uh, paper, uh, of course, uh, it's going to take uh, much uh, longer. Therefore, API will provide for speeding up of uh, all sorts of operations. And I would hope that API would not become uh, uh, the uh, uh, case of big data. You know, everyone's talking about big data. Nobody actually understands what it's all about. Everyone says that they're using it, but don't quite understand what they're using. So I hope we won't start joking about APA in the same way we joke about big data. So uh, the most important thing is to provide a particular product, focus on the product, and if you put it on the market uh, and be responsible for it, uh, it will be successful. And of course, it is a game for for larger players, and they have all the opportunities under the sun to do that. Uh, thank you uh, very much, colleagues. Uh, unfortunately, we don't even have time for questions uh, because the next uh, session is due to begin. But today, we have raised all uh, the aspects of open banking, the uh, participation of the regulator, the responsibility, the standards. And I suppose the right answer to the question about obligations or right uh, is uh, obligation and right to survive. But I would uh, provide this, the following um, uh, to provide rights and obligations for the client, creating value within the bank and share it with the client and raise it for the clients of banks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to give my gratitude to the speakers and to the participants. Thank you very much.